Hey, Mr. P here. Hey, it's Mr. Schmitz. And in this video, we're going to talk specifically about human population growth. In the last couple of videos, we've talked about how populations grow, as well as how we quantify population growth as ecologists. And so now we're going to apply that to human population growth specifically. Let's get started. Here's a graphic showing you human population change over time. You can see on the bottom, it's got the human population growth over the course of the years, as well as on the other axis, you've got the total population all the way up to approaching 8 billion. We did surpass 8 billion in 2022. So this graph shows 2019, but we are now past 8 billion people as of a couple of years ago. Just a couple of statistics looking at the human population growth. First of all, what shape of curve does that look like? That is is or appears to be a J curve to me. Which if you think back to our first lecture, that would be an exponential growth curve. So the human population spent some time for sure in exponential growth. And just to illustrate that a little further, the human population hit 1 billion people in 1804. That was the first time we reached 1 billion people. It took us 123 years up until 1927 to reach 2 billion people. So we doubled our population in 123 years. It only took us then 33 years to reach the third billion people. So going from one to two to three billion, it took us 123 years and then down to 33 years. We hit seven billion people in 2011. I was a junior in high school then. Well, I actually remember it. We talked about it when it occurred. That was something we talked about in our history class. So we reached seven billion people and it's only been 11 years in between us going from 7 billion to 8 billion people. And while we're talking about exponential growth, you said 127, which seems like a long time to reach 2 billion, between 1 billion and 2 billion, 127 years. But prior to the 1 billion, how many years total is that to reach 1 billion? Um, well, I am not a math teacher, but quite a few. <laughs> I would say well over 1,800 years. Yes, over <laughs> 1,800 years substantially. Um, just to put it into perspective, though, ladies and gentlemen, 1927 is the year we reached 2 billion people. My grandfather was actually alive in 1927. He is no longer living today, but that's all right. But he, he was all alive. He was born in 1919, so he saw 2 billion people reach Earth. Um, wow. Yeah, and now we're at 8 billion people. That's one, two generations? One generation? Yeah, two. Two generations. Two generations removed. Yep. So that's how quickly our population is changing. And if we extrapolate that out then, and we start looking at how quickly we reach or double our population, we're gonna start increasing by billions in just a handful of years. Absolutely, yeah. The other thing that this shows before we move on here is the density of the population on Earth. So you can see on the top part of this map, you can see kind of where humans are located and, and the density that we're located in. And as you can see, there are many areas that are more dense than others. There are a lot of areas that are very low in density. Uh, what do you notice about the trends in density, Mr. Pfeiffer? I know, first of all, if we point out this key just so that we have our bearings straight, as we get darker in the colors, we get more dense. And so when we're looking at this map, if we look at the or key in on the darker areas, that's where the human population density is the highest. And so when we think back to our last video about how populations are distributed, this seems to be very distributed around resources, which means while we're talking about being centered around resources, this would be a clumped distribution. Obviously, you can see that in most countries, or at least most continents, the, the highest population density is located around the coasts, where a lot of the resources can be brought in. A lot of our foreign trades and a lot of our foreign goods are going to be distributed and obviously brought to the coast, as well as water, which is obviously one of the most important resources. Absolutely, yeah. The other thing you can kind of see is sort of the origins of, of the human population. The human population began in equatorial Africa and sort of expanded out from there. And so you can see a large population density there. We obviously have a large population density in India and China, um, which is where a lot of the global population is, is still growing and is responsible for. Those are the two largest nations on earth, the United States being third. And then you can obviously the, see the density in Europe there as well, which has had civilization for many thousands of years in Europe, which is why we still have a very dense population in Europe. Yep, obviously uh, Japan over here in the Pacific is really highly populated as well. But I think overall that you typically see a lot more of the population around the equator on the planet, Absolutely. just based on how they originated, like you said, and, and how they've spread. Mm -hmm. It also, I think, is a much easier climate to live in year round. Absolutely. Also, if you think about 
productivity and our understanding of ecology, that's where you're going to see a lot of our natural resources due to the high levels of productivity around the equator. A lot of trees. All right. So if we graph the human population, like we talked about, we have seen a period of exponential growth. And so we've got that J-shaped curve right now. What we're seeing is that we're sort of somewhere around the top of that line where Mr. Pfeiffer is drawing here, and perhaps slowing down and reaching a carrying capacity. I say perhaps. Why, Mr. Pfeiffer? Because there is still a wide debate over what the human carrying capacity is. We've heard reports that it has basically been as low as, or projected as low as 8 billion, which is obviously where we're at, up to around 16 to 20 billion, uh, depending on resource allocation. So why is there such a range of human carrying capacity prediction? That's a fantastic question. Well, let's think about what humans are able to do. Humans are probably the only species that can truly change their own carrying capacity. We have the ability to harness resources in a way that most other species do not. We have developed technology in a way that no other species has before. We ship our resources globally, mm -hmm. right? We send planes and trains and boats all over the world, shipping food and water and resources all over the place, which allows the human population to continue to grow despite maybe some places on earth running low on resources. Right. And another big one, while we talk about technological advancements, are the fact that we have developed refrigeration. That's a fantastic point, right? We're able to store food, we're able to save food, and not just food, but think about the medicine and the advancements in t technology in keeping people alive that humans have been able to invent and perfect and improve over the years. And just within the agriculture advancements, I mean, the advancements, technological advancements in genetically modified organisms, increasing nutritional content on specific food crops, being able to harvest a bigger yield per acre, being able to ship those globally, like you said, and or ship them via refrigerated cars helps to conserve the nutritional content of the plant. Yeah, absolutely. And so for a lot of these reasons, we don't know what the human population's carrying capacity is. We do know that there will be a carrying capacity at some point. And what we have seen, if you see that bullet point up at the top, is that the human population growth rate, so how quickly we are increasing, has peaked. And that peaked in 1960, or around 1960, which means that we are slowing down the growth of the human population but we are still growing, obviously. Yeah, and I could see that this could be a misconception where the human population peaked around 1960, and that is not what this is saying. This is saying the growth rate peaked at 1960. And so if you were to look at the exponential growth and you zoomed in, the growth rate would be peaking where that slope is the most vertical. Right. Right. We are slowing down. So if you were to look at the overall trajectory, it's still exponential, but the slope is slightly less steep. So yeah, on our graph of logistic growth, you could say we're potentially entering the S portion okay. of that graph. And uh, while you said we will eventually hit our carrying capacity, if we think about the information discussed in the last lecture, most organisms, and I think humans included, not only will reach our carrying capacity, but it is likely we will overshoot the carrying capacity. Right. And when that overshoot of our carrying capacity occurs, there will be a lack of resources, there will be a period of spread of disease potentially, and a lot of those density dependent factors that we talked about last lecture could be affecting the human race more than they currently are. Right. And science is a really important factor here. We have some really intelligent scientists that are looking at carrying capacity and, and looking at resource allocation, but science only provides us a projection. Correct. Right. There you know, likely isn't going to be an exact number modeled in a carrying capacity study until we hit it. Absolutely. So how do we better project and better understand the human population? We're going to talk about two ways that we can look at and quantify human population change that give us some of these concepts and ideas that we've been discussing. The first is called the demographic transition. And so this is a study of how nations or regions grow and change over time. And there are three stages within the demographic transition that you will need to know. The first stage, think about the origins of a country. So we'll use countries as an example here just to kind of help us make sense of this. Mm -hmm. So using the United States as an example, because we're all familiar with the United States and you are all in history classes. Stage one would be the origins of the United States. So think about the beginning of the United States, let's say, you know, early 1800s. So we have won the Revolutionary War. We're, in, we're into America now. In stage one of a country, you see 
And this applies to basically every country that we have ever studied on Earth. So every country in stage one has a high birth rate, meaning lots of babies are being born, but also has a high death rate. And those two numbers are almost equally high. And what this tells you is that lots of individuals are dying and lots of individuals are being born. So the total population isn't changing very much because birth and death rate are relatively equal. So we have a small change in overall population size, but death rate and birth rate are high. So there is a ton of babies being born, but there are a ton of individuals dying. So why might there be a ton of deaths or a high death rate in an early nation? Well, I would say a lack of infrastructure overall, sanitation, slow transit times, long distances between civilization cities. Yeah. Lack of refrigeration, lack of running water, medicine. Yeah, if you think of all those things we were just talking about with the human carrying capacity, uh, those were all issues in early nations. As in the United States early on, it was hard to get to a hospital if you were sick. It was hard to get food. Citizens just don't know. Like, science hasn't caught up. Right. right. And so because of that, lots of people were dying, lots of babies were dying. And so you had larger families because many people didn't make it to adulthood. Right. You had large families because you knew you had to plan for losing some. Right. Right. And then as you see a society as a nation progress, you enter stage two. And how does a nation progress? Well, you successfully start caring for your citizens. So this is a great win for a country, right? We've reached stage two. We're caring for our citizens. Uh, we now have ambulances driving on roads, getting people to hospitals. We now have a method in the hospital of making sure that the doctor is washing their hands between mm -hmm. births, right? And surgeries and things like that, which you might chuckle at, but is a real law that we had to pass mm -hmm. that believe it or not, doctors were mad at when we passed because who were we to tell them that they needed to wash their hands between surgeries? Right. The whole idea of aseptic technique um, came about as a result of increased sanitation protocols. Right. And so in stage two, what you see is a massive decrease in the death rate, but the birth rate remains high with sort of this lag behind. And so what do you get when you have a high birth rate and a low death rate? you get this gap between the birth rate and death rate, and this is when your overall population skyrockets. Absolutely. So birth this rate, birth rate stays high, death rate uh, remains low, people are living longer, so longer lifespan. Which allows for more children. Right. A longer reproductive year or uh, reproductive years. And so what you're gonna see in stage two is this is where the bulk of population change will occur within a nation. The United States has, has made it through this stage, but we made it through this in the early 1900s. And so we are now past this stage, but a lot of countries are currently in this stage. And knowing that as a scientist, you can identify which countries globally are giving the largest population change to the world. Uh, and so there are some, some countries that we're still studying today that are currently in this here in 2024. Uh, but in this stage, again, this is the one that has the low death rate and a high birth rate, which gives us a big population change. Mm -hmm. Eventually, you reach stage three, which is where that birth rate does fall to meet the death rate. This is usually a societal change that causes this. Uh, basically, families realize we don't have to have as big of families anymore. To use my own family as an example of this, my dad is one of nine kids. Uh, he was born in the 1950s. His dad was one of 14 kids. He was born, like I mentioned earlier, back in 1919, okay? And so I'm one of three for reference. You can see over the course of basically 100 years, the family size has decreased from 14 kids to three kids. And again, not every family has that many individuals in their family, but that's just an example of kind of the societal shift that has to occur for the birth rate to decrease to meet the death rate. And these societal changes are going to come about as a result of financial decisions. It also comes out of, like, necessity. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, families don't have to be nine kids or 15 kids large because, for the most part, the agriculture industry has transitioned out of, like, the manual labor yeah. side to more of the technological side with the invention of more efficient tractors and yeah, more absolutely. efficient combines. And so what we see here is this sort of meeting of the birth and death rate and this is sort of where countries will hopefully remain 
indefinitely. And could you say that this is slow growth? Absolutely. This is what we want. This is a stable, slow population growth that is manageable, projectable, and usually something that's pretty easy to deal with. The United States is currently in this stage of growth. The U.S. population is over 300 million people, but it's growing slowly, um, and it's easy to project those changes. And while we talk about stability and slow growth, this is, like you said, much easier to control because when we have to ramp up production of certain medicines or ramp up certain production of medical devices, um, it is obviously easier to do that when you are slowly growing mm -hmm. as opposed to like population boom. Right, exactly. So next, and we'll finish with this next one, this is the other way that we're going to understand the human population. And we mentioned this in the very first lecture as well. This is called an age structure diagram. And we talked about obviously males being on one side and females being on the other side. And when we talked about it before in our last video, we had an actual axis over here with numerical values. And you could extrapolate what age each band is, but you can see down here that there are three general colors in this particular age structure diagram. You have your pre-reproductive ages, your reproductive ages, and your post-reproductive ages. Obviously, reproductive ages are probably the most important when we talk about population growth because this is the age band that produces more children. Right. And so you have basically four examples. You have countries that are maybe still in that second stage. Yep. This is going to be a country that grows more quickly. Um, you can see that there is a ton of pre-reproductive. So this would be your young children and your babies in your population. You also have a relatively large reproductive age band. Um, but people are reproducing quickly. They're producing a lot of babies, but they aren't living as long either. Right. So what type of countries would these be? Guatemala, Nigeria, Saudi Arabia, maybe India mm -hmm. still in that yep. category as well. When you go into that slower growth, you see that it is less kind of curvy or less exponential. We are still growing. This would be the United States. This is where we're at. Australia and China, two other countries. But um, we have a larger pre-reproductive population than we have reproductive, but it is very slow and controlled. We also have a really long lifespan or a relatively long lifespan compared to other countries. It also is showing you that females live a lot longer than males do. Yeah, so when you look at this, you obviously see that the middle point kind of looks like it's skewed, um, where there's a bigger bulk, especially as you get into the upper age groups. There's much more females um, in that post-reproductive age group than there is males. Moving forward, you see stable growth. So this is sometimes combined with slow growth. So the two in the middle can sometimes, they sort of bracket those together to be called slow or stable growth. Uh, but to talk about it and separate it a little bit, stable growth would be even more vertical uh, where you have pretty much an even distribution. We would call this replacement level fertility. So these countries are having enough offspring to make up for the individuals who are dying, but not really much more than that. Um, and this would be really into that third stage on our last slide there, where this is a really stable population where you're, you're not really changing the population number at all. And then you finish with what's called a declining population, which this is sort of an inverted pyramid. And some examples of this are some of our older European countries like Germany and Bulgaria. And this population is actually a population where there are more elderly individuals than there are young children being born. And so this population is actually seeing a decline. Some other stressors that a country like this might be facing would be things like care for the elderly, right? We're running out of people to fill jobs as well as taking care of an aging population. Right, like a retirement system. Right. These would be pretty much your working people, right? Maybe some lower end post-reproductive years, but these people would be working to help support and care for the older people. Right, which can also lead to having even less kids because they're spending more time caring for their aging parents. Mm -hmm. So what you're seeing is this population is actually going to start declining. And so these countries are, are facing different sets of challenges than the countries on the other end of the spectrum. Not to say one is better than the other, but they are challenges one way or the other. So that's it for this video. If you learned something, give it a thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel. We'll see you next time. Thank you guys so much for being here.